totally fine. Um, great service last week. Can I get it Amen. Great service. And, um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll just be honest with you, just speaking from the flesh, I'll just get away from the pulpit. I, I wish sometimes I preached in a box where I didn't see anyone and no one saw me. And, um, because and I don't and the reason I'm saying this I don't want you to discourage because numbers will do that. Last time we just said it's like man this week's gonna be an R. So uh, encourage me, I'll encourage you. I, we're doing right, and um, I thank the Lord for. Miss Judy too, and, and thank you so much for the, the music. But don't don't we miss Judy? Amen. Amen. Sets a whole pattern and uh, tone for the day. Such a gentle spirit, and she's just flexible to say, you know, do what we ask her to do. So uh, miss uh, miss Judy. So pray for her. If she's under the weather, and um, be encouraged to be in God's house. So we can uh, we can be excited. He's the same risen king this week as he was last week. It's just good to celebrate this week as we did last week. and um, So be encouraged by that. But, uh, thank you again, William, for the recorded music. We do miss Miss Judy, so when you see her, make sure she knows that. And um, well, it just makes the whole service just, just seem real. <laughs> real. And so be, be energized by the word, right? We're in 1 Peter. And I'm going to be up front with you. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? I don't do traffic counts. And I, if you, you know, we got hit outside, I don't have the answers to how to fix that. And, uh, thank the Lord during our sunrise service that nurses were here when the child was choked. I, didn't, I don't know what you do. I mean, I preach the gospel, right? And so thank you that we're equipped uh, here at the church to, to meet all these various needs. And I, and I will say, uh, as a minister of the gospel, you know, uh, there are challenges in God's Word. So in reading First Peter, I've been challenged by what the Word says and the original language, and you can go through uh, the tense of the Word. So I just want to encourage you to just hang tight there as you, as you read this and uh, as you begin to apply it to your life. Uh, it's very important here. So uh, real quick before we get going, uh, just turn to your neighbor left and right. Because I feel like I'm just kind of moving. So you turn to your neighbor left and right and say, he's still alive. Just real quick, yeah. left and right. He's still, he's still alive. He's still alive. Hey, girl, he's still alive. Hey, hey man, he's still alive. Right? I get bombarded, you know, I, come, I come to preach to God, and then I, I get all tongue-tied because I'm trying to think of how to say the announcements. I just preach. I'm going to let Angie start doing the announcements. <laughs> I'm going to preach, and uh, let me let me go through some things with you. I don't know if you're hot, but if I start throwing this jacket, I'm not in the spirit, I'm hot. Um, suffering saints, we've been talking a lot about suffering saints, right? Suffering saints, just a few weeks ago, here's the words we said. Uh, so I like to do a one one line sentence so you can kind of stay with me. Suffering saints serve while making a spectacular scene. So people are watching what you do and everything you do, uh, right, wrong, or they're they're casting judgment on your life and your beliefs, your standards, whatever uh, words we can apply there. Suffering saints serve while making a spectacular scene. We went to Easter Sunday and the Lord just began to deal with me on those words. So I, I, He allowed me to tweak it to this: Suffering saints serve because a spectacular scene was made and what a spectacular scene it was our best plans uh, to go to a tomb with spices that we've prepared will find an empty tomb instead of a risen savior and for many of us in our life spiritually i think we have found an empty tomb and not a risen savior so let me encourage you today uh, in those regards here's the thought for today here's our statement uh, we're still in first peter he's talking about suffering saints which by the way would that not rule out to you the prosperity gospel. I mean, there's a lot of suffering in God's Word. And there's a lot of warning about it and encouragement about the suffering uh, you may be going through. And some of this is spiritual suffering, uh, but a lot of this is physical suffering. There's a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering physically for the cause of Christ. So hear the words today. Suffering saints 
serve to see the world saved from an all too familiar path. We'll talk about that path today, but I'm in 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm, I'm beginning uh, verses 1 through 7. Suffering saints serve to see the world saved from an all too familiar path. I'm going to begin with these words, and these are words that you can see, and I've broken it down to three things just for my mind, but not for you, and you can jot it down if you want, but I really want you to remember the statement about the suffering saints. But here's my words, and I just jotted this down, suffering saints. There's something about that, there's something really for me as a human, uh, just to be in that element to say that's kind of fearful, even though the Lord says not to be fearful. Uh, to think that someone would physically harm me or you because we fell in love with Christ who was already in love with us. But that is true, that around the world many would, um, would rather have you suffer uh, for the cause of Christ. So I wrote down the words, suffering saints. I pick up in verse 1. For as much then, the translation would say, so then, as Christ had suffered for us, how did He suffer? In the flesh. And you can bracket that out and begin to put the words, it was a physical pain. You can go back a week, you can begin to read and study and apply, and you can get into God's Word, and you can go through the celebration that we had, that Jesus Christ here on earth suffered physical pain. So He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to feel. He knows what it's like to hurt. Uh, we've gone through this many, many times. Christ knows what it's like to be hungry and tired. Uh, was anyone tired this week at all at one point this week? Can you just raise your hand? I just want to make sure I'm not alone. <sighs> Let's just all exhale together. <laughs> well, the encouraging part is Christ knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows also uh, from His choice and His power what it's like to suffer. And the Bible confirms that. It says, so then as Christ hath suffered for us, how in the flesh, which is physical pain. Notice what he says next. You've got to be really careful with the words and really careful with the translation. He says, arm yourselves. But he's talking about the continuing thoughts, so you've got to put it all together. He said, Christ suffered in this physical pain, so therefore arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, which is translated attitude. And because Christ suffered physically, he says, go ahead and settle it in your mind. Some of you may suffer physically for the cause of Christ. This is a whole section on the suffering, right, of, of the saints, those who are born-again believers, those who are followers of Jesus Christ. He said, just like Christ suffered, settle in your mind. It's this attitude adjustment that you too may suffer. Now, here's what we do when we realize there's pain. What do we do? We get away from the moment of pain. Now, for many of us, and again, I've shared this with you, and I'm not a doctor, right? I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we suppress uh, emotional pain uh, uh, through the world of medicine, and some of that's really good, and some of that may not be. That's between you and your doctor. But here's the point. Uh, for many of us, maybe we're not feeling what naturally God's put in us to feel. Because pain causes us to move. Remember what I said, if I go at, at the house and... Uh, Let's say on our stove there's a little red light. So when, when the stove is still hot, even though the eye doesn't show it, the light's on. So what does that light tell me? Hot. What would happen if the light went off but it was still hot and I touched it? What do you, what do you think my response would be? I don't know your response because what's in the heart comes out the mouth. And some of us get a scar. You get a scar. Right. So I would immediately not verbally, but physically, remove myself from the situation. So, as a follower of Christ, if I realize that continuing to follow Jesus uh, sold out, on fire, like spirit field, we can go through the whole revival thing. We say all those words during revival. If I continue in that phase and I realize that by continuing in that manner, physical pain will come into my life, I would be more apt to say, you know, I think my time's up. I think it's someone else's job, and I'm just going to pray for you and be encouraged. So he says, settle in your mind right now that for the sake of the gospel, some of us may suffer physical pain just like Christ did. Suffering saints serve to see the world saved from an all-too-familiar path. So there's a reason that we continue to push forward. So he said, so then, or for, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, which is physical pain, he says, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, translated attitude, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased 
from sin. Underline those words. It's a really powerful moment in the life of a believer. But notice what the translation says. If you are suffering like this, you have stopped or maybe you are finished with sin. You ever just had enough of something and you say, you know what, as much as I thought I liked it, I'm, just, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of all the drama and the turmoil. I'm sick of all the feelings that I have and I'm just going to walk away from it. I'm just sick of it. So here's the whole thought in this passage. Some of us have gotten to a point in our life where we're sick of the results and the lifestyle and the pattern of sin in our life and we've moved on from it even if it means suffering for Christ. He says, if you're living this way, and regardless of physical pain, regardless of where you are, if you're pushing forward for the cause of Christ, then you've come to a point in your life which is really powerful for you, and it's really important for your family, and, and for your church, and even for your society and our great nation. He says, you have come to a point in your life where you've settled in your mind that you are done with sin. Notice what he says. He says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men. Here's the translation. You won't spend the rest of your life chasing your own desires. I pause for effect. If you ever get to this point, now some of us, now we've got to be really honest with ourselves. It's called self-evaluation. We can't get to the next verse. We've got to hang out in verse 1 until we settle this in our mind because verse 2 is really powerful in the life of the believer. Because for some of us, we've decided, I'm sick and tired of living for sin. Notice what the translation says. If you're suffering like this, you won't spend the rest of your life chasing your own desires. What's the greatest thing in this life? Is anybody in here, if we're really honest, and I'm going to be honest, so I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll go first. You got a wish list of things you'd like to own in this life? <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> And uh, how are you going to accomplish it or uh, what line of credit you can secure or whatever it takes to get the item or the trip or, or the event or whatever would make or complete your life. Have you ever seen something and you say, that would complete me? That watch, that ring, that shirt, that car. I've always longed for this. I've always wanted that. I'm not going to say a word about you, honey. I'm not going to say one word. <laughs> and you just you have all these lists. And you want to accomplish them in a window of opportunity. Why? Because at some point in your life you were a baby, and then you're worried at some point in your life you're not going to be able to enjoy it. So you got a window of opportunity. And notice what he says here. He says, when you really get this, when, when the Spirit of God gets hold of you, and there's very few in the Bible that we can see that with, he says, when it gets hold of you, uh, notice this, suffering saints, he says, you won't spend the rest of your life chasing your own desires. And if we're here today and you know your heart, and if you're chasing your own desires, you've got to go back to verse 1. You've got to hang out there until you settle in your mind and change your attitude and begin to suffer in the flesh that means you're ceasing or stopping from sin. For the time, notice verse 3, for the time past of our life may suffice. Here's the translation. You've had enough of what the world enjoys. And for many of us, maybe we have. And, and for the rest of us, we're trying to figure it out. But really what we wanted in the whole deal, what we really wanted with Christ is, I don't want to go to hell, and I do want to go to heaven. We didn't realize that there's really a lot he's asking us to do, not to get to heaven, to avoid hell, because all that took place, what we celebrated last weekend, it's the resurrection of Christ, and it was the game changer. It's the game changer for all of mankind. This, this changed the game of life. And, and we're under grace. And, and now we can be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And we can be alive forever. And we'll get to all those points here in just a second. But notice what he says. He says, when you really get to the point in your life where you're sick and tired of what sin does to you. You ever, you ever had a, a habit in your life and you're trying to kick whatever habit it is. But you feel like you continue to go back and say or do what you've always done. And you say to the Lord, I don't know why I keep doing that. Would you please forgive me? Now here's what will happen in your life. You get to the point where you're like, God's tired of hearing from me and I'm just going to quit asking Him. That's a lie of the devil. <laughs> you just keep coming and pleading. Some of us will get to the point that I'm sick and tired of living that way. I'm sick and tired of feeling that way after I've done what I've done and said what I've said and gone where I've gone. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm done with that part of sin in my life. Now this is a lifelong battle. Can I get an amen? Amen. 
it's a lifelong battle with sin, right? Until we get through the tunnel, which we'll talk about in a second, when we're on the other side. It's a lifelong battle. But for some of us, we're going to get it. I really encourage our young people, get it early. Get it early because your wish list, can I hear it from the adults today, your wish list tends to grow as life goes on. Can I get it again? That's why I tell, you know, mom and dad's always like, uh, well, what are you going to do with all our stuff if the Lord calls us home? It's gone. There is no way we can go through that stuff. I'm telling you right now. Has anybody got a lot of stuff at the house? Yep. I know, you ever use this? I know it's here somewhere. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, it's spring. It's time to spring clean. Notice what he said. You don't want to spend the rest of your life chasing your own desires, but you want to do, according to verse 2, the will of God. You've had enough of what the world enjoys, verse 3. When we walked in, notice these words, I'm going to pause and I'm going to help with the words. When we walked in immorality and lust, that's the way we used to go. When we used to live this way. When we used to live after feasting and drunkenness, that's the way I used to live, after the things of this world that would fulfill me physically for a moment and allow me to have fun on this side of eternity. It's being with my friends. It's doing and saying. And notice what he says. Not only that, but wild parties. And not only that, but terrible worship of idols. And he said, I'm really sick and tired of living that way. There are many, many born-again men and women who were sick and tired of sin and gave their heart and soul to Jesus Christ that are on fire for the kingdom of God. There are many, many people who have said, now, uh, some of us were saved young, praise be to God. He didn't want you to have those stories. He really didn't. But now that we have them, he wants you to share them, not in a moment of glory or boastfulness, but in a moment to say, you know, I got sick of that. And at some point in your life, you'll get sick of it too. How long did it take you from the moment you moved out of your house and you're living on your own to become sick of the bills coming in? Did it take you very long? <laughs> have the bills stopped? outside. Mom said the mailman came. It, he didn't bring anything. He just leave it on out there. <laughs> I'll get it in a day or two. It'll pile up. It's nothing but bills and ads. I don't need it. I wish you'd keep some of that. So at some point in our life, if we turn that spiritually, we've got to get to the point where it didn't take us long with bills. Why? Because it's something we didn't want to do. The challenge spiritually is it's drawing us from things we want to do to something that we didn't naturally want to do. And he says, some of us have got to, we've got to become suffering saints. We've got to be drawn to it. We've got to become sick of it. We've got to have had enough of what the world enjoys. And notice what he says, suffering saints, but I go a little further. Have you ever used this term, stranger things have happened? Something happens in your life, you say, man, stranger things have happened. Notice what the Bible says. He says in verse 4, wherein they think it's strange. What do we say about us as followers of Christ? I said, we are what? Peculiar people. We're different than the world. We're peculiar. Like the church attracts all the peculiar people. But God naturally says born again means you're peculiar. You're different than the world. You're going to respond differently. You're going to live differently. You're going to be different. And notice what he says. Stranger things have happened. He says your, notice the words here in verse 4. He says your former friends are surprised. That you no longer live the way you lived. You no longer go to the same parties. You no longer talk the same way. You no longer uh, speak and do and act and live. and you, you, no longer, you no longer do those things and your friends, but notice what took place. Your former friends are beginning to say to you, you're not who you used to be. There's something different about you. Matter of fact, the Bible says, and I don't know if you've experienced this, if not all, then... I would say a majority of us have experienced verse 4 and we didn't even realize it. But he says, they begin to speak evil of you. What's the translation say? He says, they're going to slander you. You ever been slandered in your life? Could you admit to that today? Does it anger you for someone to talk about you? <laughs> Especially when you find out they have, they don't know that you know, and you want them to know, and all these knows, knows, and everybody's going to know. And <laughs> when they slander you, this goes all the way back to verse 1. You've got to have this mind. You've got to have this attitude change that the things after this are coming in your life as a follower of Christ. Because when you begin to live a righteous life, when you begin to live differently, now what happens for Christians? Here's what happens. I'm afraid that we can't tell followers of Christ from the world. We're intermingled. We're, we're together because we don't want to be slandered. 
And we want to belong. We want people to like us. We want them to understand that we can follow Christ and be cool and have fun and do these things. And notice what the Bible says. No, you're going to have to decide in your life. You're going to have to get to a point that you're sick and tired of what sin will do to you. And may I encourage you and warn you this morning, sin is devastating in your life and in your family and even in our church. Sin is, is, is dangerous to, to all of us included. He says your former friends are surprised and even to the point that they'll slander you. But make no mistake about it, you know, stranger things have happened, right? Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? He said, make, make no mistake. He said, I, I want you to be aware of something. This is your warning. This is stranger things have happened, right? This, this is the warning to you. This is the warning to your friends or those in relationships in your life. He says, here's the warning. Uh, there's a God and He's going to judge their life. And notice what the Bible says. They'll give an account. Every person will give an account of their life to who? To God. They'll give an account of the way they live. And you can go all the way back to that verse and look through all the, uh, the lifestyles that's there. The feasting and the drunkenness and the parties and the terrible worship of idols. And we would pause and say, I've never worshipped an idol. It's, worship originally was what value we placed into someone or something. Worth ship. What worth did we put into that? And if we've placed value in things in our life, then we're worshiping that. Now, what level of worship? That's I don't know. You you would have to determine that. But if you put that over the Lord, and you've put an idol, and He said those are terrible idols. Now, there's many things that were going on here, but that would apply to us today. What have we placed worth into in our life? He says, these unbelievers, are, they'll give an account of their life to God. This is your warning. This is what you tell the world, that they'll give an account to God. And here, here's what he's saying, and this was what was taking place in your life. Unbelievers are amassing a debt that will take an eternity to pay back. And such were some of us, that we lived a life outside of Christ, and we were accumulating debt. Have you ever accumulated debt in your life? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, the credit card's amazing. Like, it's really easy to slide. It's very difficult to pay off, right? Uh, weight, weight's the same thing. It's really fun to put it on. It's really hard to take it off. It takes a lot longer to take it off, it seems like, because you know, you're living in the moment of accumulating. Notice what he said. He said, uh, those outside of Christ, which were us, but God paid our debt. He wiped that clean. But... To die absent from Christ means you've accumulated a debt in life that you'll stand before God and give an account. How are you going to pay for this debt? And, and God's answer would be, it would take an eternity to pay this off. You ever said that? It'll take, it'll take my lifetime to pay this off. I'm in my children. So it'll take a lifetime. He says, you're amassing, you're accumulating this debt. So my last thought, as we move into verses 6 and 7, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I want to encourage you today, there's light at the end of the tunnel in your life. Whatever you're struggling with, uh, let me first encourage you, uh, follow Jesus Christ, be born again. That's what the Bible says, to be born again, to accept His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And He can save your soul, and He gives you light at the end of the tunnel. You ever been in a tunnel? Everybody's been in a tunnel? <laughs> like there's a few uh, structures that kind of just blow my mind. Like every time I go through the tunnel, I'm always thinking, what keeps that mountain up. You ever thought that when you go through? You ever notice when you're in the tunnel, like you, you know, for us that lives here and we're familiar with it, we're comfortable with it. Have you ever been in the tunnel with someone out of state that's in the tunnel, maybe for the first time? <laughs> well, hey, buddy, speed it up here. We're gonna get out of the tunnel, and you can you can kind of tell they're really close to one side and they're really nervous. Tunnels will do that. Um, bridges will do that. Like, hurry up, buddy. There's a bridge here. Let's get off the bridge. Uh, there's under underwater tunnels that go under the ocean, and, and you don't know. So you don't know what's on the outside of the tunnel. If, if they blindfolded us and took us on a trip and said, hey, by the way, you're now in a tunnel. You wouldn't know what tunnel, you wouldn't know where you were. So you wouldn't know what's above you, right? You wouldn't know what's going on outside. And here's what really happens in your life. I want you to think of this tunnel. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Notice what verse 6 says. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are what? Circle underline it. Dead. And because of this warning in the previous verses that they're going to give an account, he says that's why the gospel was preached to those that are 
dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit, which again, we're talking about suffering saints, those who are being are suffering for the cause of Christ. Here's the translation. That's why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. That's why the good news is preached. That's why the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached. It's a warning, and thanks be to God that I received the warning, and He saved my soul. And my debt is now zero. It's about. I mean, I have nothing. I can stand before Him and give an account of my life in the Gospel, but not the debt that I've amassed or accumulated. But I'll live according to God in spirit. So He says, it was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the spirit. Now, there's a lot of thoughts in those passages. There's a lot of study. There's a lot of uh, what I would say opinions about those verses. And, he, and I'm really convinced at this, and I want you to hear this. I believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed since the very beginning of time. Amen. I really do. I believe it's been proclaimed. I believe there was men and women who rejected God from the very beginning. They didn't believe it. It was babblings. It was vain. It didn't make sense. I believe when they stood there and Noah's building that ark and they said, he's crazy. It's, it's not rain. Why would he build an ark? And he preached the gospel that said salvation is coming your way. There's a storm coming and it's going to rain. And then the moment it begins to rain and the door is shut and there's no hope. Hope is over. Do you ever realize as people we're always looking for a second chance? And we live under grace and this is what I, when I say we abuse grace. We're always looking for a second and third and fourth chance and God's merciful and He'll do those things. But let's say there's one chance. And notice what the Bible says in this in this verse, he said he preached to them that are dead. And I believe there's a lot of things going on here. And a couple in particular, I want you to pay real close attention. I believe that he's proclaimed the gospel to those who are already dead. And they had a moment to accept or reject. And I also believe, and here's something that's really, really powerful. That I think took place just as we celebrated it a week ago. I believe from the moment that Jesus died to the moment that he was resurrected. I believe Jesus preached or declared to those who are already dead, those who had heard and rejected, there is no second chance for you. The one you heard about is standing here. I'm King of Kings, I'm Lord of Lords, I've sealed this thing. There's no, you know there's a gospel today being preached, that a gospel of second chances. Christ ended that at his death before his resurrection and he sealed to those who were already dead and here's what I believe he said he says I'm the king of kings I'm the lord of lords and there's no second chance for you can you imagine the moment and those would beg that you tell their loved ones that this place is real and I also believe he preached and proclaimed to those who were in paradise for the first time I'm, I'm, I'm grace and I'm the gospel and I'm the good news and I'm Jesus Christ and today for the first time in your life I'll lead you from here to heaven. So that now that it's sealed, that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Notice what he said. He said that's why the gospel's preached, to give a warning to those before they die, because from the moment they die, it's over, it's sealed. The Bible says it's the spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that gives us life. And the flesh that we live in uh, has no profit. There's no gain. The words that I speak unto you, Christ said, they are spirit and they are life. Changes who you are. And notice what the Bible says. There's light at the end of the tunnel. When you're in the tunnel, you don't know what's going on, do you? Remember that? You don't know what's going on. Here's what I know in the tunnel. If you're driving in the tunnel, especially with those out-of-towners, you know, and you're used to the tunnel, you've got to pay real close attention, don't you? Because they'll hit their brakes, and some of us are real daring. We'll pass in the tunnel even though you're not supposed to. And because we're used to it, that's what happens in life. We get used to sin. We just keep flying around with it. We're in the tunnel, and we're driving. We've got to pay real close attention, especially if it's a new tunnel, and we're watching for brakes. But here's something you can't do in the tunnel. How many U-turns have you seen in the tunnel? <laughs> you know what happened? What would happen if you had a U-turn in the tunnel? Disaster. Disaster. Let me tell you something spiritual. God, at some points in your life, puts you in these tunnels. You don't know what's going on above. You don't know what's planned. You don't know what's outside. 
And for many of us, he's warned us, don't, don't do the U-turn, because when you U-turn, relationships will fail, and your finances are out of control, and you go back to your former friends, and all these things, it's going to be destruction for you and for those around you. For many of us here today, we've made too many U-turns in the tunnel of life. He says, be really, really careful. You can't do those things when you're in the tunnel. And it's really important that we pay real close attention. And what happens at the end of the tunnel? We see that light and for some of us that are holding our breath in the tunnel, because some of us do that across the bridges, the driver is really mean. They'll slow down on you. You got to be really careful, so you can't panic. But when you see that light and you see that tunnel open up, it's like a brand new world. There's light at the end of your tunnel. There's a world waiting for you. Notice what the Bible says. Notice verse seven. The end of all things is at hand. The world as you know it is quickly coming to an end. Now here's what he's proclaiming. Even though you're suffering, Christ could return at any moment. Now we've been preaching this for a few thousand years in the world saying, where is he? You're foolish. Why are you taking up your time? But notice what the Bible says. God is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But he's long suffering. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to you he doesn't want anyone to collapse. He doesn't want anyone uh, to give an account of their life, the debt that they've accumulated. So he's given us time to preach and proclaim the gospel. He's given you time to settle in your mind, to proclaim once and for all, I'm sick of the way sin's affected me, and become the witness that God is destined for you to be. He's got a plan for you. The end is, is at hand, not just the end that it's final, it's the beginning for you. When, when your life ends, it's a brand new world. And when Christ comes back, it's a brand new world. We're leaving a tunnel and we're opening up to something beautiful. He says the end is at hand. So notice what he said in verse 7. Here it is again. Underline the words. He says, be ye therefore, what's the word? Say it with me. Sober. What's the word sober mean? He said sober up. You're intoxicated with the world. You're, you're, you're thinking and dreaming and looking. But notice what he says. He says, be sober and watch unto prayer. So here's the translation. Be earnest and be disciplined in your life. He never said to sit still. He never said to hope and wish. He never said to shut it down. He says to keep working for the kingdom of God. Be earnest in your approach and in your life. And be disciplined for the kingdom and the cause of Christ. And that transforms who you are. It'll change your marriage. It'll change your life. Suffering saints serve to see the world saved from an all too familiar path. Here's what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 7. I'll close with this thought. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. Don't you hear this? The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide uh, for the many who choose that way. It's an all too familiar path. It's an easier path. And he says this highway is, is really large. It's wide. I mean, you can, there's plenty of room to travel. And he says you can only get to heaven through the narrow gate. But he says this highway is super huge. It's an all too familiar path. Everybody knows about this road. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road to life is very difficult. Notice what the Bible says. Here's our warning. Only a few ever find this road. So we, for once in our life, we're sick and tired of what sin has done to those around us, what it used to do to us. 